Thank you all very much. I'm Kirk Varnado, and this is the fourth of six Mellon lectures this spring on the subject of abstract art since Jackson Pollock. Um, as usual, I arrived at the gallery um, early to run through the slides, and I can't help but notice, as I have for a couple of weeks now, the long lines of people who line up for quite a while to get in here, and I'm uh, moved and stunned by this uh, and can't tell you to all the people who sit there and wait to get in how much I personally appreciate this and how much I feel under pressure to make this worthwhile <laughs> both for you uh, and for all of my friends who have come from New York and elsewhere to be here. Uh, let's start right in with a uh, Robert Morris installation at the Duan Gallery in 1966 on your left and a Dan Flavin Diagonal for Robert Rosenblum, the single fluorescent tube of 1963 on the right. Um, the last time, which was a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about art of the early 1960s that came to be called minimalism uh, in sculpture like the work that you see on, these, on the screen now, um, whose search it was not simply to escape the cognitive response of recognition, that is, it didn't want to look like a dog and it didn't want to look like a landscape, this stuff, but it really had a more ambitious um, desire to escape categories of cognition, to escape niches that were simple like painting or sculpture. Uh, Judd's famous essay on this new work in the early 60s was called Specific Objects. Uh, making objects was different from making standard genres of art. That is, the idea was to find a body of work which couldn't be classified and therefore could only be dealt with on its own terms, could only be looked at exactly for what it was and not put into some ready bin of understanding. And I talked also about Barbara Rose's uh, evaluation in the mid-60s that the two guiding spirits of this new work were Malievich the Russian constructivist artist, the Russian suprematist artist of the teens, and Marcel Duchamp, the great ironist, that is the two patterns being an absolutely idealist or pure form of geometric uh, abstraction, as posited by Malievich, or a high ironic kind of art, as posited, say, by Duchamp's decision to select a urinal and put it in an art exhibition. The very fact that minimalism succeeded in making in something like Flavin's piece, which was if not a urinal, then certainly a piece of ordinary hardware uh, brought on Canal Street, say, uh, and yet aspiring to the kind of purity and idealism of Malievich, how minimalism succeeded, in fact, in confounding categories and leaving people in doubt, in honest doubt, as to whether it was affirmative and idealist, continuing a modern tradition of innovation and rejuvenating that tradition, or whether it was ironist and nihilist and negating the idea of innovation and creativity in a Dada or Duchamp sense. Today I want to turn away from the early 1960s to the later 1960s, say the, oh, I don't know, the period roughly from the Warren Commission to Watergate, if you want, um, <laughs> when the urge to escape categories uh, on the part of artists become all the more difficult because minimalism itself has become a category. So it's no longer possible to produce a cube that's just a cube. It's going to be a Don Judd reference at the same time. And this happens, this installation of a minimalist tradition or a minimalist reference happens extraordinarily fast. You need to remember how fast in general things happened in American society in this period after 1963 and into the early 1970s. Just calculate that the months, you know, the sort of spasmodic, violent mood swings of society in this period left only months between Woodstock and Altamont. It meant the difference between the spring of 67 and the spring of 68 was absolutely every difference in the world. That many of us who grew up in that period expected a new Beatles album every few months which would change our lives completely so that the difference between Revolver, Rubber Soul, Sgt. Pepper and the White Album was like several different universes one had lived through in swift succession. So there's an enormous fast pace in society in general and in the art world in particular, an acceleration of a couple of things. The massive amount of information that one gets through magazines like Art Forum, and I owe a lot in thinking about this period to my wife, Ellen Zimmerman, who was an artist emerging in Los Angeles precisely in that period, 
as a graduate student, and she's talked about the overload of information, the sudden awareness that every twitch on the web sent out a repercussion to the farthest end of it so that every art student was aware of the latest show at Castelli or the Green Gallery and pressured by an overheated market to develop the next new thing. More information, more market demand for novelty, faster societal change means that almost before minimalism can be born, it is a tradition. It is something that has to be addressed. Now, there's an odd paradox that happens under the pressures of the late 60s in the art world, and that is the anti-institutional aesthetic, the anti-institutional ethic that affects so many people in this period, a rejection of power, a rejection of the standard conventions of society, makes artists want to go away, uh, not just from specific objects in, John's, in, in Judd's sense, but away from any kind of object. They want to make things that are too big, too ephemeral, too unmanageable to be collected or exchanged on the market. And the odd perverse thing about this urge away from the collectible object is that it makes sculpture dominant. Um, the the d dialogue that we talked about last time between the painterly impulse of Greenberg's uh, urging of Lewis, Olitsky, Poons as the tradition versus Judd's push towards Lewitt, Andre, etc. This is clearly decided in favor of literalism and sculpture in the late 60s because sculpture turns out to be the ultimate none of the above category. That is in the sense that painting is only painting and cannot seem to include the literalism that three-dimensional appropriation of real materials in the world, for example, has. Sculpture can include video installation, earthworks, performance, etc. It turns out to be a labile term, as art has been a labile term in the 20th century, that is a term that is constantly transforming itself by taking new things into itself. As a category, it is flexible and expandable in a way that painting is not, and sculpture then is the dominant uh, work of the period that we're about to examine. Because it can take into account both the literalism of weight, gravity, specificity, the sort of kick it specificity of minimalist sculpture, at the same time that it can, and we'll see this happen again, reintroduce in a transformed fashion the pictorial in a way that it seemed to be excluded in early uh, specific object work. What we're going to talk about today is the idea of a generation of artists who absorb the formal terms of minimalism in the mid-60s, but then challenge immediately minimalism's basic premises, who institute an implied critique of minimalism's claim to a kind of blank neutrality, a critique that's realized almost as fast as minimalism itself crystallizes in the mid-60s, and then is catalyzed, this critique, very strongly by the whole wave of change in society and a different set of attitudes that we crystallize around the spring of 1968. The most easily pegged of these critiques or changes of minimalism is the intrusion, once again, the repositioning of image recognition, the thing that installations like the one on the left had thought to banish, to push out, the young sculptors of the mid-60s and early 70s find that with just a slight tweaking of Morris's forms, for example, you can reinstall them within the categories they had sought to escape, specifically the categories of purpose-built architecture and design. So that a work like Joel Shapiro's untitled piece of 1973-74 sort of simply takes the triangulation of the piece in the background of Morris's uh, work and puts it on top of one of the blocks in the foreground and comes up with a kind of monopoly house. Um, and the idea is that what Shapiro is rethinking here is the idea of symbolic form that is form that has a symbolic resonance with things outside it, that is not specific, not merely its own height, uh, width, etc. at the same time that he is precisely rethinking the specificity of height and width in minimalism so that the scale of this piece, which is about this big, becomes extremely important. And if you look at a Shapiro installation from the mid-1970s and compare it to the Morris installation, you get the point exactly. I think that the whole idea of the bodily association of scale is itself being re-ratcheted 
so that the little pieces on the floor are not just things that are in the present tense, they're like decoys or models, things that refer to the imaginative reconstruction of shelter and domesticity, of bins, of things that at the same time make us feel enormous and send us off into other spaces. So that the whole idea of the specific theater of activation of the gallery space begins to be associated not with a blank kinesthetics, but with the stimulation of imagination, the stimulation of, imagi of memory, the stimulation of metaphorization. Architectural sculpture is not limited to work like this. However, there's a whole raft of architectural sculpture in the early 70s that would be connected with a work like Alice Acock's uh, ramp structure here, for example, of 1978. A kind of sculpture that redefines the sense that's implicit in some of Morris's installations and other installations of enclosure, for example. The whole question of what that circle in the background might mean, the whole question as to whether that wedge in Morris's background is not rather like a ramp, for example, and gets into a set of associations with architecture which are not neutral associations but which have to do with the poetics of space. The exact title, in fact, of a book by Bachelard, which was extremely influential on Acock and others that space, enclosure, up, down, is not neutral but involves attics, cellars, facades, doors, entryways, etc., and produces a whole bunch of art which, while it has the modular construction of lumber that would make it like a Lewitt, the geometric forms that would make it like Judd or Morris, in fact are constructions away from logic and towards memory, fantasy, and dream worlds. Um, the other pole would be the direct re-embrace of utility and functionalism on the part of an artist like Scott Burton. Burton takes the exact forms of minimalism, as in the Morris installation on the left, and through them revisits the history of design and its interchange with or fusion with the history of abstract form. One of his great heroes, for example, is the Romanian Parisian sculptor Constantin Brancusi, and he looks again at Brancusi's studio and the sequential relationship between the furniture Brancusi sat on, the bases he put his sculpture on, and the symbolic forms that constitute the sculpture itself. So that now, instead of decategorizing, instead of moving away from the functional or purpose built, as the minimalists tried to do, Burton takes the same forms and by pushing and tweaking them, pushes them back in order to assert aggressively how the symbolic, the abstract, and the functional are not isolated, uh, for example, specifically in the Russian constructivist tradition, in the tradition that came out of Malievich, for example, and Rodchenko and others in Russian revolutionary art, where the whole idea was that there was to be an intimate link between so-called pure abstraction and the transform, transformation of the whole man-made world. So it's interesting that Burton, who comes out of performance art, should reinvest a social dimension into the nature of shape and make it adhere again not only to different aspects of, say, the Russian tradition or Brancusi's tradition, but to a history of style. In this way, through artists like Shapiro, Acock, Burton, the blank forms of minimalism are reinscribed and tinted with associations. But their kind of direct recurrence to imagery, in Shapiro's case, or to function, uh, in Burton's case, are not my main story today. I want to stay instead with the life of abstraction, imageless abstraction, where some of the same issues we've just visited of the psyche, the body, of social order, some of those same images are invested into the reductive vocabulary of Judd, LeWitt, Morris, and others by a whole new generation which is in thrall to the powers and permissions of minimalism's new abstract vocabulary, but pressed at the same time by the world they live in to speak that vocabulary in another voice and to make it bear unexpected meanings. And it's through this group of artists that I want to discuss now that we see yielded by the early 70s a transformed abstract art, self-declaredly within the descent of minimalism, but also attacking it and becoming more evidently representational in a much more broad and imageless sense, more diffuse and ultimately more powerful, I think, than pediments or chairs, than any one image or function assigned to a shape. 
to talk about this group of artists, I want to examine the basic properties that were extracted, as we examined in earlier lectures, from Jackson Pollock's drip paintings, and for which Judd and others argued as a new transformative model in American abstraction. They found in these drip paintings, first of all, a greater simplicity or wholeness. That it was, there was no sense of hierarchy, no sense of detachable parts, but an all over web of creativity on Pollock's canvases, which seemed to them to have a unity and wholeness which was new. That Pollock's work seemed to them to posit a new kind of order, which was non-compositional. Instead of a balance of internal relationships, you had a composition that was determined in large part by the unmediated literalness of its processes and materials. So you remember Judd saying about Pollock's poured paint lines that they are in fact poured lines of paint, that they have this directness of, me of the medium they are, they are in and of the process by which they are made which become the work of art without any kind of attempt to compose a hierarchy of things or a balance of things, but are realized in a new literalness. These things, simplicity and wholeness, order, process, materials, become the watchwords for a new generation of artists in a transformed fashion. Let's look, for example, at Michael Heiser's work on the right called Complex One in the Nevada Desert begun in the early 70s, 72, 74, and part of an extensive complex that Heiser is still working on to this day. The parentage in forms like Morris's, I would hope would be clear, no internal parts, a kind of unified geometric wholeness, but now not opening as Morris wants to on a kind of unfamiliar neutrality, but onto the evocation of the primal in a different sense that is a reduction towards simplicity in the hands of Heiser and others means not simply generic fundamentals but a specific archaism in which the devotion to the Russians, which certainly Heiser had to Mayevich, to the other abstractionists, fuses with a interest in say pre-Columbian architecture to the ball courts at uh, Chichen Itza or Ushmal for example. And in Heiser's catalog and these sources are made quite clear, and here is one of the pages of Heiser's sources, which include things like Easter Island, the horse on the Dorset Plains, the rock-cut uh, sculptural caves of Alora, uh, the architectural models carved in living stone at Mahalabalapuram in India, etc. This is a different kind of simple, which Heiser spells out in his distinction in an interview between what he called megalithic and piecemeal societies. That is, the kind of societies that express themselves in wholeness in a single large rock form, like the carved out things in Ellora or Mahalabalapuram, versus so societies that build by little bits and fragments. And he specifically calls modern society a, a piecemeal society, the kind of thing that builds with pieces of steel that assembles things by little modules, versus the great grand solidarity of the old stone cultures the megalithics. Heiser is drawn to the kind of simplicity that links forms to the material of the earth itself and that are simplified too by being blunted by time. Things that have eroded, things that have lost all excrescences, ruins which are stumped down as the ball courts are to their basic underlying form. Now this kind of simplicity or traction is of course personal to Michael Heiser because he's the son of archaeologists and he grew up surrounded by uh, pre-Columbian work, by other kinds of archaeological forms, but this kind of simplicity or interpretation of simplicity and unity of form is also very much symptomatic of the time in which Heiser comes up in the mid uh, and late 60s, uh, in then the early 70s. One has only to begin to run down a little library of paperbacks we probably all have buried somewhere that would include Stonehenge decoded, uh, the Tao of Physics, the Dancing Wu Li Masters, etc., etc., in which, and God forbid, Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Donneken, uh, in which uh, the popular equation of the period was that the most advanced and the oldest forms of understanding were the same thing, that advanced quantum physics and uh, 
the Taoist thought, for example, were the same, that Stonehenge was in fact a giant uh, computer, etc., cetera, et cetera. So that the present and future, the best imagination of the future, was linked to the deep past in a way that totally negated any idea of progress or the idea of history itself. So the timeless forms of minimalism, that is the forms that Morris and others had thought were immediate only, without reference outside themselves and only had a present tense existence in the gallery, now are timeless in a different sense in the forms of, say, complex one, in the sense that they seem to collapse alpha and omega. That is, they are both present, future, and deep past, instead of merely immediate or blank. Now, the text that one needs to think about uh, in relationship to works like this is the book published by George Kubler in 1961 called The Shape of Time. Because Kubler's is a pure formalism, that it is all for abstraction. Kubler's is a theory of the development of the history of art that wants to eliminate biography, the subjectivity of individual lives, and wants to eliminate thinking about any symbolic meaning. It's an arch minimalist kind of book in this sense, in that it doesn't want to deal with symbolic form, it doesn't want to deal with reference, it only wants to deal with the pure forms of things. It, and in that sense, it's related in some sense to Greenberg, but it is, if anything, the anti-Greenberg. Because whereas Greenberg's emphasis on, quote, pure form, was a thing that was about purification of the individual media and getting down towards the essence of painting, for example, Kubler's formalism is a leveling formalism that wants to deal not only with works of art, but with everything, pot shards, chairs, spears, anything that human beings produce. It is a leveling formalism that wants to eliminate the barriers between the fine and applied arts just as it will eliminate any biological metaphor of growth, whereas Greenberg's theory of form and formal development in history is Hegelian and leads towards a kind of increasing perfection or realization, Kubler's theory, more clinical, based in theories of anthropology or linguistics, charts from a great magisterial overview the flow of pattern development in 5th century Greece, in China, in Mayan civilization as constantly recurrent patterns that have to do with the eventual exhaustion of choice. That instead of leading towards a kind of perfectionism, there's a kind of degenerative in a certain sense or exhausting uh, nature to Kubler's proposal about formal possibilities and a kind of pessimistic idea that the invention of form is a zero-sum game and that what's been made before reduces the possibilities for what can be made in the present. And he speculates in a way that I think many people in the late 60s may have found appealing. He speculates that instead of the modernist notion that we have in, in front of us an endless series of options and a whole bunch of possibilities, then in fact, we may be in fact approaching the end of a set of possibilities. There would be much more invention behind us than there is in front of us. And this, I think, synced not only the formalism, the divorce from the idea of meaning, not only did this sync with a minimalist and post-minimalist generation, but increasingly at the end of the 60s, the pessimism of running out of options corresponds to Heiser's statement to his interviewer that he suspected we were, quote, living at the end of time. Um, and Heiser's project for the complex in the desert, this great monumental series of abstract forms, equates the erosive force of centuries, that is, the idea of the blunting of ruins and grand residues of past societies with the explosive force of the present and that he makes clear that the uh, complex one has been made in the Nevada desert close to a nuclear blast site and that in fact its angle is designed to, re to shield or deflect the power of a nuclear bomb. Um, so that Heiser's form is elemental or reduced in a way that collapses the idea of time into a view of the present which is if, certainly not neutral, but colored strongly by a millennial, a sense, an almost apocalyptic sense, excuse me, that reduction and simplicity is a way of hunkering down against the forces of history 
wherever they are. That is, there is here in this work a kind of expanded concept of time, of vast eons that will stretch after us, that have stretched before us, which is linked to the idea of scale, of making things big and making things in open space. That is, simplicity becomes associated with monumentality in Heiser's work in a very specific way. Now, we talked about the minimalist idea earlier in earlier lectures of reducing internal relationships within the work. And in Freed's qualification, um, what he disliked about minimalism was by reducing those internal relationships, the work of art became redirected out into what Freed called a theater or a theatrics of the relationship of the person and the surrounding space to this object in the, in the gallery. This sense of the theatrics of space is what becomes vastly extrapolated beyond the gallery in so much art of the late 1960s. And Heiser is one of the key exponents of this idea of moving out into a much broader canvas to work on, literally. Um, he uh, begins by making vast marks in the desert, often huge circles, um, uh, with his motorcycle, by the way, driving sort of Malievich by motorcycle, driving around uh, in the desert, and also huge dye paintings, these kinds of things that are visible only from X thousand feet above. The most impressive and best known of these, and still survives, is Heiser's double negative of 1969. Uh, it's on the Virgin River Mesa in Nevada. And you can probably see from the overhead view that it involves two trenches incised on either side of an eroded canyon so that looking across them, one completes it in the idea of one big slash, like the hand of finger of God has come down from above and cut straight through, or of something which formerly was unified and which the forces of erosion or incursion have disrupted. The idea of a great simple geometric gesture put in conflict or contradiction with the erosive structure around it. A huge mark on a vast space in a way that takes the notion of Pollux, expansion of scale, and the idea of moving beyond the fringes of the canvas into an entirely different dimension. Um, it's a kind of work that is not to the uh, taste of everyone. And I remember very well, I included Richard Long, the British artist, and this is one of his works on the right, in an exhibition in the mid-80s. And Long was vehement in his dislike for the kind of work Heiser was doing, though in many cases they're often lumped together because Long himself worked out in nature uh, by doing things, for example, like arranging this stone line in the Himalayas and many other kinds of circles and connections in which, like Heiser, he reached back to a deep past of stone carns, for example, and stone circles around the world of maniers and dolmens is very much his personal vocabulary translating the geometry of minimalism into the deep past and out into nature. But for long, this was based strongly on the personal experience of solitary walks, which he would document, and which seemed to belong to a kind of British lake country picturesque which has merged now into a very ecologically correct light touch. What Long really hated about minimalism, about the earthworks of people like Heiser and Smithson, were that they seemed to be a realization on a cosmically destructive scale of the vast ego and American power mania that had been built into minimalism in the first place that it was everything about the kind of cowboy recklessness of Pollock realized in an egregious and destructive fashion. But I think, in fact, there's something more complex going on in the Heiser, and I'd like to stand up for it in a certain sense and for work like it. That what you need to think about in Heiser and other work like it in the Earthworks is the play between the close-up and the far away, between the kind of eye in the sky, if you want, on the left, and the view with one's feet on the ground as on the right. And this is another view of double negative looking into one of the trenches on one side. The trench in double negative is an interesting thing to look at. It's like road cuts, or it's certainly like the trenches that he saw his father dig through archaeological sites when he was a child. And it's all about bedded layers of structure bedded layers of geology or in archaeology human development that represents stratified time, time which is accretive, time which is textured, time which is the cumulative buildup of minute incidents. 
versus the overview, the aerial view, which shows double negative as something globally unified with a brute unified simplicity, uh, which stands out as a kind of man-made absolute against the geological forces of erosion of the canyon. Simplicity then, the idea of simplicity with which we started, could be said to depend in these works on just how far back you stand. And that's an odd echo of an old theory of sculpture. That's Adolf von Hildebrand's theory from the late 19th century in which Hildebrand contrasted the near vision of things. That is the kind of muddle of fragmented piecemeal visions of things one has when one's up close to it, the kind of subjective disarray of intimate experience versus what he saw as the proper role of a classifying art, pardon me, classicizing art, which was to clarify things as if they were seen from a distance. That all sculpture should have a kind of fern vision, that is a far, a far distant vision, fern saying, which is, uh, has to do with decisive certainty rather than fragmented uncertainty. And this distinction is brought into relationship, it seems to me, by works like Heiser's where simplicity in the aerial view is in tune with literally the big picture, the faraway picture, that is the megalithic forms of the past and the vast eons of time are fused together, whereas from on the ground, in fact, the whole thing is a muddled array of many, many thousands of layers of fragmentation realized through acts of crumbling destructive violence. So the kind of grand aura of clarity and simplicity is the privilege of the aerial view, the distant view, the vast global reach of time, whereas on the ground one sees only the force and brutality of the cut and the crumbling variety and diversity of the earth around it. This implies, I think, not merely a formal problem, but something that has social implications as well and has to do with the relationship between individual experience and that of collective societies. And I'd reiterate that and just to put that on hold and come to another example, and that is the Smithson Spiral Jetty. This is Robert Smithson Spiral Jetty in its canonical representation on the right. That's John Franco Gargoni's photograph of it when it was first made in the Great Salt Lake in Utah in 1970. Um, the number of people who have seen or ever seen the spiral jetty versus the number of people who know the Gorgoni photograph is a ratio of infinitesimal smallness to vastness. This is certainly one of the uh, great and, and canonical images of the art of its time, one of the most known and least seen works of art ever made. And on the left are a series of stills from the film that, that Smithson made about the spiral jetty during its making, which is, in a sense, almost part of the artwork. In fact, originally he had thought of having a small theater next to the spiral jetty where the film would be constantly projected. What the film promotes, and you can see it in this selection, are two sides. On the one hand, the, the micro side and the macro side. In the micro side, one of the things that he photographs and constantly refers to is the crystallization of the Great Salt Lake. The boulders at the top right brought down to the thing in the middle which shows salt crystals forming on rocks, a kind of incrustation in which the salt of the lake will engulf the thing that he has made like rust in a certain sense with an accretive piecemeal blanketing over of the form that he's made. This is happening on a micro level, whereas on the macro level from overhead, as in the two photographs on the upper left, for example, you have a primal form, the spiral, of ambiguous growth and decay, the form of the Nautilus's shell on the one hand and of water going down the drain on the other. The other thing that's missing from these things is that the micro vision of the making of the spiral jetty constantly makes intercuts between bulldozers pushing rocks and dinosaurs. So again, there's this sense of the relationship between a deep, lost, and destroyed past and the violence and force of contemporary society, the, the nuclear Mayan uh, relationship, for example, of Heiser replayed in a different way. So on the one hand, you get crystallization, corruption, and accretion, bulldozers, etc. And then on the other hand, you have this great, blank, desolate, cosmic implacability in the overhead view so that close up 
Everything is power, jumble, violence, and slow fragmentary accretion. And above, everything is only a great simple rune. I've elsewhere written about the idea of the overhead view in modernity and what it means. The former idea in things like this Maholi Nagy photograph from the radio tower in Berlin, the former idea of the direct overhead view, which is very specific to the 20th century, involved a kind of optimism, a, a kind of freshness, shock of the idea of a non-human objectivity, something that got away from the pathos of perspective, where things got smaller as they got away from you and laid the world out in front of you like a God's eye viewpoint that was appropriate to what was called the new man. That is the idea of the overhead view of detachment from the earth, of impersonality and objectivity became the emblem of the shock of fresh defamiliarization that would lead to a kind of de detached and superior knowledge of the world that instead of the muddled thing of perspective where things were blocked one from the other, that from overhead one saw the schematic truth of the world exactly. But now, in Smithson's Spiral Jetty, and here's another view of it taken recently when it reemerged from the Great Salt Lake, now in an age where artists are shaped by the first photographs from space in the Apollo program, where the Earth is seen as a lonely little blue marble in the middle of a great big black space, now there is a less hardy sense in the loss of the human viewpoint. And objectivity at a distance and overhead becomes not about the new man, but about things primordial. That is, lost civilizations, like those who made the Nazca lines in Peru. It becomes not so much about schematic truth in its freshness, but about an aged sense of mystery and distance whether it's the Nafka lines or the snake mounds in Ohio, the overhead view of these things unintelligible from the earth, but only intelligible from space, speak to enigma and to mystery. One prior example of this kind of work in sculpture is the Osamu Noguchi sculpture made to be seen from Mars of 1947. A, a little corny, perhaps, in its or orchestration of pyramids and mounds. I mean, there's Heiser's Complex One at the top and the Egyptian pyramid at the bottom for the nose. Uh, it it's depends on image recognition. But interesting in that it is made, in fact, in 1947, precisely after the bomb is dropped for the first time. Remember the old saying about the um, 1960s that um, we were either going to get stoned into the bomb age or bombed into the stone age. <laughs> That there were two, the two things were related, um, and the idea was that we were living in an age of almost immediate extinction. Heiser's interest in the nuclear blast, for example, linked us back to a stone age. That's all that was going to be left of us after the bomb devastated the earth. And it's interesting that the Noguchi in 1947, in some sense, prefigures the Smithson uh, in, in the late 60s and early 70s because there are odd echoes of early abstract expressionism in this body of work from the late 60s in the combination of interest in science and dread of it and in the collision between microbiology on the one hand and runes and symbols on the other that you see in the spiral jetty in some sense is a re-evocation of the world, world of Rothko, Gottlieb, and Newman in the late 40s under the threat of the first advent of the nuclear age. In the Vietnam War, it all comes back with a new fearsomeness. Let me just briefly recap what I've tried to do here. I started with the idea of simplicity or wholeness as something that the minimalists derived out of an interpretation of Pollock's canvases. I then said scale and the idea of objectivity were also involved and that these were all for the minimalists purely formal properties which they claimed to be only pragmatic, neutral, and involved in a present tense experience. That was the early 60s, but by the late 60s, under a different set of societal pressures, the anti-individual, anti-subjective premises of geometry, simplicity, wholeness, which for the minimalists, they were at pains to say that these were not ideal, that these things which were anti-subjective and anti-individual did not have any of the kind of utopian flavor of Mondrian, for example, and, and of former geometric idealism. Now the problem in the late 60s 
is that far from being ideal, these forms are no longer merely positivist or pragmatic, but are tied to a millennial pessimism with a nostalgia for simplicity and the power of mammothly illiberal societies of the deep past in thrall to monolithic order. Present tense experience of simple form is replaced by a kind of melancholy of duration. It's as if uh, Monet's Gar Saint Lazare and its empiricist present tense modernity is replaced by de Chirico's train stations. There is a reduction here of a different kind, a reduction not pragmatic but having something to do with the catastrophic and the epic. I use the word order, monolithic order, about the megalithic societies, for example, that Heiser talked about. And I want to turn now to the idea of order that the minimalists proposed, an order taken out of, again, Pollock's webs of paintings, which was non-relational, non-constructed, unbalanced, non-compositional, decidedly non-ideal. What was important when Stella said about the order of his canvases, what you see is what you see, you remember that his bugbear was Vassarelli, and he and Judd battled against J Vassarelli's idea, partly because of what they disliked about the European nature of Vassarelli's order and geometry was that it seemed to have a whole kind of social agenda to go with it. And what Stella and Judd assisted is that's not us. There's no social agenda in what we're doing. Our geometry doesn't connect to any social ideal at all. That's part of what becomes problematic for artists in the late 60s. And the most evident shift against the early 60s geometry, post-1968, say, is its simple rejection in favor of an organicism. And it's partly that with the Pollock retrospective of 1967 at the modern, when the pictures are seen again, their liquidity becomes much more interesting. So that early 60s or mid-60s pieces, which had, on the basis of John Cage, been interested in dispersal and random order, such as Carl Andre's scatter piece, for example, here of 1966, or many works by Barry LeVay at all, at also, um, turn in the late 60s to works like Morris's Thread Waste, uh, which is owned by the Museum of Modern Art, gift of Philip Johnson, which you, in fact, you own it in a big bag. It's a bag of thread waste, and you pour it out on the floor in whatever order. Um, so that this corresponds to the article, in fact, that Morris wrote precisely in 1968 called Anti-Form, in which he argued that the best new work was going to forsake the geometric rigidity of the early 60s and be floppy, scrappy, and chaotic, and having no edges, being more liquid, more dispersed on the floor. This simple reaction, this organicism against geometry, is perhaps too easy in the way that, you know, turning a cube into a house is a little too easy. The more interesting and widely evident in the art of the late 60s and early 70s is the staged collision between order and disorder, between geometric rule structures and recalcitrant irregularity and shapelessness. It involves, instead of simply a change from one thing to the other, a kind of aggressive hostility against the precedent. Uh, you know the old thing, it's, it's not enough to succeed, others must be seen to fail. Um, it's not enough for disorder to be abandoned, uh, it must be dumped on. It's, uh, order cannot simply, the idea of order in the work of the late 60s is that order cannot simply be, it must be shown to be something that is imposed, contrasted, and contested. And one expression of this in the late 60s and early 70s is the widespread interest in mapping and the whole idea of the map, the collision between order on the one hand and brute information on the other, between schema on the one hand and fact on the other, between mind on the one hand and nature on the other. And one of the most evident examples of this are the series of works that Robert Smithson did called Non-Sites, which involved photo maps, in case this one is of Franklin, New Jersey, on the left, with realizations in the gallery of minimalist-like boxes with rocks and earth from the various points in the non-site brought in. They're specifically not important sites. They're meant to be utterly banal. 
um, the, the Franklin, New Jersey thing. And the idea is to map out a collision between imposed order here and the actual uh, fact of life on the ground in rock form. And it's a kind of, in Smithson's case, a diagrammatic or didactic collision, which again involves the clarity of the overhead view versus the chaos of the ground level reality, and in which minimalism's rigidity is made evident by piling it in against rough chaos that it contains and cuts. Uh, again, you might bring into comparison Richard Long, and here I show you the Whitechapel Stone Circle that the National Gallery of Art owns, which is on view upstairs, just as a generic example of Long's work, where the geometry of minimalism seems to emerge in the kind of rough way that a beaver dam or a honeycomb is made in harmony uh, with the order of nature, so that there's a kind of rough justice about the balance between the diversity and irregularity of nature and the beautiful harmony of the thing created from it that goes back to a tribal sense, again, of stone cairns, of cir tribal circles, etc. Smithson's is much less optimistic. In fact, it involves a kind of dystopic unity of ruinous and catastrophic and chaotic nature with a kind of fatally rigid man-made order. Think by comparison, for another comparison, with Tony Smith, who we talked about earlier. Here's Smith's drawing for a linear city involved with a kind of honeycomb or crystalline structure of 1953. Going back to Smith's training with Frank Lloyd Wright and others, there's a kind of optimism here that the structure of crystallization, the structure of honeycombs, the relationship of microscopic physicality and biology can all be used as a happy precedent for the strong social organization of humankind. Smithson's image of order in humankind is rather different. And here is one of the many illustrations that he used for one of his essays in which he shows a tank farm of repetitive gas tanks blighting a landscape. Smithson's idea of crystallization, on which he spent a great deal of time, was that it was a kind of inorganic stasis, that simplicity uh, in crystallization involved the end of life. And repetition for Smithson was not a happy uniformity like the honeycomb, but more in these uh, tank farm pictures, more like, say, uh, Warhol soup cans. That is, they had a kind of repetition which spoke of conformity and stultification. So in Smithson, minimalist order, the order of geometry, the order of repetition, is consistent not with growth and optimism, but with entropy, a, a, a concept in physics with which he spends a great deal of time. Entropy, as you probably know, is the state attained in heat death. Uh, it's the second law of thermodynamics in the universe. It's, well, Is that in recognition of entropy, or? Uh, <laughs> I'm obviously being, oh, there we go. My light has come back on. We've just had a demonstration of the laws of physics. And, um, Smithson wrote a great deal about entropy. It, it, the idea is that the universe is constantly losing heat and losing organization and that the stasis or simplicity at the end of it all is moribund death, that is the end of information, a kind of heat death towards which the universe is inexorably moving. And Smithson's best essay, perhaps, was the one that he wrote in 1966 called Entropy and the New Monuments, in which Smithson talks about the life of artists in the late 60s spending their time in bad movie theaters on Times Square watching B-movies. That is, there's a kind of William Burroughs-like downbeat experience of seedy urbanism in Smithson that he wants to lure, lure and link to the idea of a cosmic vision of where the world is headed. You know, I mean, there's a Woody Allen film where as a small child, Woody is brought in by his mother to the doctor because he's obsessed with black holes and he's sure that the world is disappearing momentarily and what's the point of living because black holes. The whole idea that if your vision gets so cosmic and enormous, well, Smithson's got the idea that something about the bleakness of contemporary urban existence was in fact linked inexorably to the truth of macrophysics. And the idea of the experience on the ground and the experience from the sky of the galactic and the urban were put together in a way that was uniformly bleak and suggested that art, 
society and nature were all winding down together. It is, Smithson's, a kind of Eliotic modernism. That is, its relation, relation is to Eliot's The Wasteland. And it's interesting to compare Smithson to Heiser in the sense that I think that Heiser's experience as an archaeologist, is what, as, as a child of archaeologists, is what informs his work, whereas what informs Smithson is a kind of lapsed Catholicism. Smithson's early work is full of really uh, aggressively expressionist and gory um, descents from the cross and crucifixions, for example. And he wrote an article on Judd, which must have mystified Judd entirely, in which crystallization was linked to the idea of a series of depositions from the cross. You have to read this to understand what it had to do with Judd. Uh, in the case of Heiser, it seems to me that the personal leads to something of much more general and broader interest, whereas Smithson is much more interestingly read as a personal case. That is, Judd himself said Smithson's science is incredibly sophomoric, uh, and that some of his major talents were as a didactic promoter and schematizer of certain ideas in which the works become illustrative. Um, Smithson is the kind of artist, I think, in some ways, um, aside from the Gorgoni photograph, which is an icon utterly burned in all of our minds, if Smithson didn't, have, didn't exist, he would have to be invented by graduate students. Um, <laughs> he's too perfect, uh, an, an emblematic uh, demonstration of everything that uh, is involved with the Eliotic or pessimistic tenor of late 60s and early 70s art. Let's compare something else which I find richer, and that is Richard Serra. Because Sarah is once again doing what Smithson is doing, and this is 1969. This is called Cutting Device Base, base Plate Measure by Sarah. And the piece is, oh, I don't know, six or eight feet long on the long side there in the middle piece. And what it's involved with is what is apparently a series of, say, rolls of lead, big um, pieces of timber, a piece of stone, several sheets of lead, stacked up one on the other, and then as if two huge cutting boards, chopping blocks had come down on either side, whack, everything is reduced to the base plate, hence base plate measure. Everything in Procrustean fashion is cut to managed, and the chaos of the things flies out to the side. Of course, this isn't true for an instant. That is, you had to obviously do a great deal of individual work cutting these things, but the imagery is an imagery not unlike that of Smithson's in the collision of order and disorder, in a staged violent theater about what reduction means, about what measuring means, about what simplification means, what those minimalist ideas mean when enacted. Sarah's, however, as opposed to Smithson's, seems to me less illustrative and more performative in the sense that without reference to nature, these ideas of collision, reduction, measure, and their violence are realized in more absolutely sculptural and abstract terms. Sarah's cutting device is more in some sense like Heiser's trench, a brutal cut through things. But it has its roots, it seems to me, and derives its title, cutting device, base, base plate measure, from Jasper Johns. And Jasper Johns' black device of 1962 where Johns has nailed, as he has in other pictures, rulers onto the side of the picture, and then from the nail and the ruler, dragged the ruler through the paint on the picture. Again, it's probably not as simple as it looks, and this is staged to look this way, but the measure, but the message that the Johns has, it seems to me is the message that the Sarah has, which is a more complex measure, more, more complex meaning or implication than the mere opposition between order and disorder. It has to do not with the collision between measurement and chaos, but with the fusion between the two things. In the sense that what the, Judd, what the Johns says is that creating order creates disorder. That is, by imposing one order, you must efface another. And that all acts of measure involve destructive force. All acts of irregularity involve destructiveness. That there is a kind of violence to rationality itself. Now, this is perhaps even more evident in Sarah in one of his most famous pieces that he did for a warehouse show 
1968, in which, as you see on the right, he had a tank of hot lead and a big dipper, and with the dipper flung the hot lead against the corner between the wall and the floor in the warehouse until it collided with the corner, formed a cast, cooled, and he would then come along crowbar-wise and pry the lead out of the corner and throw another one down so that each line formed by the, the lead casting itself in the corner was prized out and pulled away. Now, this leads us into another obvious Pollockian or Pollock-like aspect of the literalism the minimalists so valued in Pollock, and that is the evident declaration of process. In 1968, after the Pollock show in 67, the idea of liquidity and the process, the dynamics of Pollock's work, were used against the statics of minimalism. And you see a whole bunch of work in the late 60s where the promise of shaping by material and by program and method no longer means the geometric playing out of possibilities in, as in Lewitt's cube, but overtly liquid pourings and castings. But I raise Pollock here in this Sarah piece only in some sense to contrast him because what I want to point out is the difference between the almost lyrical nature of Pollock's choreography of his dance with the imagery in Sarah's piece of 68 of labor, of work. There's a Giacometti piece called No More Play, and in a certain sense, that's the subtitle of this work. It's all about hot metal, toxic materials, dangerous work. And this is personal, as archaeology is personal to Heiser, personal to Sarah, and he has experience in a steel mill that his father worked in boat yards. There's something very specific, but it's also, just as with Heiser, symptomatic of the time. And that if you think of the way that Heiser and Smithson both work with bulldozers, for example, and earth movers to get what they want done, then you find something consonant with the steel mill overtones of Sarah in this fling lead piece of 68, a kind of hard hat idea which says to Judd and the others, to hell with ten smiths and to hell with custom body shops. No more hands off phoning in the plans for anything. Instead, now there is a blue collar ethic of the earnest ethos of work and labor. There are two ways to look at this. One of them is by remote analogy with um, David and the stringency of David's classicism during the revolution. David brought off the revolution with a kind of stringent classicism of the oath of the Horatii, for example, a kind of cool, meticulous, lime quality kind of austerity. But into his studio thereafter came a group of young artists who called themselves the barbu, the bearded ones, who took this archaism or nearly all too seriously and began wearing togas, not bathing, uh, wearing beards, etc., and wanted art which had no color, only line. That is, there's some kind of, from the cool of minimalism, from the sleek finish of the classicism and austerity of the early 60s, some suddenly by the late 60s, you have a much more hairy, archaic, primitive, fundamentalizing view of industry in which the urbane cool of the predecessors and the masters is precisely spat upon. The other, I think, in the long run, more interesting and less frivolous way to look at it is to think about Sarah and Sarah's blue-jeaned, booted industrial imagery here in terms of the situation of the new left of the late 1960s in its relationship to the old left. Think Joan Baez singing Joe Hill at Newport. Think the Port Huron Statement. Think Sartre at the Renault factory. Think Grateful Dead singing Working Man's Dead as an album. The whole idea that the new left would recuperate the ideals and ethos of the 1930s of the old left and bring them back. This idea of a kind of nostalgia for industry has a strong political implication. The inhabiting of the spaces of exhausted industry in New York Industrial lofts, such as the one that Sarah is in now, means that these Yale graduates, 
uh, move into the idea of an assumed blue-collar ethic. There's something still more complicated, though, and specific to Sarah's work than this, and that has to do with the element of excessiveness or peculiarity about the work. Here I show you the Marcel Duchamp three standard stoppages of the teens in which Duchamp dropped three pieces of string from a given height to produce rulers that could be used for the creation of new works of art. What this involves is a kind of witty, uh, hands-off, elegant parody of the idea of science. Sarah, in the same way, with his repeated casting and throwing, not of strings with glue, but of potfuls of hot lead, is involved in a kind of brutal and ironic parody of production in which the overtones of futility, of pointless overworking, of beating your head against a wall, of dogged frustration to no particular end are written into the idea of labor that it represents. The industrial then, the nature of industrial has changed a great deal since Pollock used Hout's paint and the materials of industry mean something different in something like Sarah's scatter piece of 1967. I said earlier that they said to hell with the tensmiths and the custom body shops, this generation is so much against finish. It's against the tidy completeness of minimalism and some of its preferred materials are those of scrap and salvage, as in these rubber belted things that Sarah uses for the scatter piece of 67. Living in Soho, they simply pick up what's left in the streets, felt, left over rope, left over uh, rubber, um, the useless end of the utilitarian world. Materials with a kind of exhausted functionality which speak of the opposite of efficiency, which speak instead of overflow, of excess, of a society producing too much, and also at the same time speak of waste, detritus, and garbage. That is, it is not just non-art materials that are neutral, but they have in it the implication of a kind of combination of overflow and excess with pollution and defilement. And this is nowhere more diagrammatically evident than in some of Smithson's pieces, like this one which he did in Rome in 1970 where he got a dump truck full of asphalt and poured it down a cliff. And in this and in numerous drawings, Smithson's imagery of spillage of overage, of waste, of industrial materials is one of destruction and erosion. Um, you have to remember that this is the period of the Club of Rome report in which everyone seems to be living in a Malthusian world, the moment of the oil crisis in which there is a sensation at the same time of modern society's vast power and its despoliation of the world. Um, the soundtrack for this kind of work is maybe Neil Young's um, after the gold rush, if you remember the combined imagery of sitting in a burned out basement uh, and imagining spaceships flying through a yellow haze, the combination of a kind of sci-fi uh, overtone with a bleak urbanism is pure Smithson. Look at Mother Nature on the run in the 1970s. This is downer art. Let's face it, it is really downer art. And it's, it, it is about going down and all fall down. And the imagery of gravity in it is important. And here's the gravity in Smithson, again, obviously didactic. Smithson takes in Ohio a woodshed and simply piles enough dirt on the woodshed until the beam cracks at the top. That is, cumulative action, cumulative motion leads to collapse, leads to destruction. But again, some of the same concerns with weight find themselves in Sarah's work in a different and I think ultimately more complex fashion. Here is a piece by Sarah of the late 70s called Delineator. It's like an Andre below you and above you. Um, that is, there is not only one big plate of steel on the floor, there's a huge plate of steel above you. Think about what Andre's piece says about gravity. It's neutrality. Gravity is a fact. I've got no base. I've got nothing that elevates me. I'm just going to sit on the floor versus the utter terror and intimidation of walking between these two plates. It's the hardest thing on earth to do. I've done it a couple of times, but you have to force yourself to do it. What's interesting about the energy and the potentially destructive energy of gravity, its negative threat, not its neutrality, 
in Sarah is that, as opposed to, say, the Smithson, it is implied rather than enacted. That Sarah has managed to bring the dynamics of gravity into a minimalist stasis. That is, he has a kind of kinetics of pent-up energy in which that theater of space that Fried talked about, the dispersal that an Andre produces in the gallery, has now been realized in terms of a kinesthesia of fear uh, and menace, which is altogether particular and personal to Sarah's work and which involves a different sense altogether of the power of stasis, the implied power of things held in check. That is, again, like order, stasis is something that has to be achieved, something that has to be made in these pieces. And the most evident example, of course, are the prop pieces, like the Sarah Corner prop piece here of 1969, a series of works in which Sarah reintroduces into sculpture the idea of composition, even the idea of balance that had been so anathema to Judd and others by force of construction determined by necessity and by the forces of physics rather than by mere aesthetic pleasure. What's interesting about the Sarah is its poise, its surprising poise and delicacy. Think about the lead piece that we saw for all of its overtones and violence and industry. Think about the lead as the silvery, almost rococo feathering of those torn edges, the delicacy and sheen of that light gray lid. There is a side to Sarah which is underestimated, I think, in which here in this piece has to do with an almost ballerina-like grace that is inextricably wedded to the sense of precarious danger and which gives the work so much of its silent power. The epitome of this is Sarah's one-ton prop, or House of Cards of 1968, which is obviously a critique of the minimalist cube, a critique of Tony Smith's die, of Judd's cube, which retains Judd's antipathy to the idea of massive sculpture, but still gets back the weight and power in a relationship to gravity that is more dynamic and evident. The title is not without interest. One ton prop simply describes the amount of weight that's put up by these four sheets of steel balanced against one, one another to form the cube. But House of Cards has a different implication that might send us to something like Chardin's House of Cards of 1737. The idea of a young man building a house of cards as a metaphor of fragility, transience, and impermanence. The Sarah Cube, like others of his work, insists that all human things that are made work against and with the forces of nature or physics. That things made exist in equipoise with the pull of their destruction that they exist in a precarious relationship that is realized immediately in a work like this with a hold-your-breath stillness. Judd wanted from his cubes and his objects a kind of truth. That is, he wanted to go against illusionism, for example. He wanted to go to a kind of pragmatic, immediate, no-nonsense truth. But there is a different kind of truth, it seems to me, in the implicit still dynamics of the Sarah that have to do with a different sense of precariousness, threat, etc., particular to the artist and to the moment that he is acting in in the late 60s. Look at the difference, if you want to contrast, in the late 60s and 70s. Between Sarah's House of Cards and Jackie Windsor's burnt cube of the mid-70s, it too is certainly a critique of die and a critique of the minimalist cube, but it, it seeks a different truth. It is created by scarring, by a destructive process. It is cast concrete made by firing the thing in a wooden cradle so that the cradle is burned off and all of the scars of the burning evaporate and lose the wood around it. Form and the creation of form exist via loss, that what we have as form is the residue of violent forces and energies. It is a casting, like Sarah's lid is a casting, but it involves the opposite of Sarah's insistence in the one-ton prop on a kind of open transparency of construction. Instead, by putting these large black holes on all four sides of the cube, she insists on the idea of the geometry as containing an interiority, that the work is about concealment, 
about inwardness, interiority, and mystery, rather than transparency and immediacy, as in the seraph. Similarly, if you look at her plywood square, what's involved in the making of the plywood square is covering over geometry, burying it, making it obscure. Instead of the immediate violence of Sarah's gestures in, in say, the flinging lead piece, what's involved in the method, in the process of Windsor's piece, is a kind of slow, diligent, patient aggression against order. An aggression against order by its own means, by discipline, by routine, by repetition. The labor, like Sarah's, is repetitive, but involves a different program, a different way of being repetitive. It's in a work like The Four Corners by Windsor, like Sarah's, egregiously overdone, impractical, but now methodical, in a way that is incantory, ritual, obsessive, patient, entirely different. The program is fulfilled, like the program of a LeWitt series of open cubes, but now not the playing out of rationality, but a kind of overdone, irrational, unnecessity of making. And this is a bound grid by Windsor of 71, 72, and a bound square of 72 on the right. Windsor's methods are not violent. They're not about cutting, throwing, breaking, but about binding and joining. As in Smithson, as in Sarah, the imagery of this is of a collision or a disparity between the will to order, the will to regularity, the will to geometry, running up against a recalcitrant roughness. But in Windsor's case, it seems to have a built-in pathos of shortfall, which is explicitly pre-industrial and involves a kind of illogical, almost tribal pragmatics of making. When you compare Windsor's work to Sarah's or to Heiser's, you're dealing with different personalities, certainly, different temperaments, different psychologies. But I wonder if you are not dealing, too, with two different ideas of labor, as we raised the idea of work before. That Sarah's is the industrial and demonstrative, and Windsor's is the personal and private and concealing and muffling. That Sarah's is the factory, and Windsor's is rustic. That Windsor's is the world of Ruskin and Morris and the redemptive value of handwork and craft, whereas Sarah's is the world of Walter Ruther, the Teamsters, the AFL-CIO. <laughs> this is a built-in ambivalence on the left of the 1960s. Two parts of its ideal metaphorized in the abstract forms of materials, programs, attitudes to work, and ideas of order. When you think back about work like this and about the earthworks, it is easy and it was easy then to see it as radical art. But are we not also seeing a kind of conservatism in this work, in the monastic palette that runs to grays, to leads, to felts, to scrap, to dirt, to tar, in the earnestness it has even in its absurdities, in the fandom on nostalgias for collective order. There is a romanticism, in other words, about this work that at its worst comes to a sentimental nihilism of blank despair. But I've spent too much time on the down implications of this stuff. I want to sum up by saying what I'm trying to say here is it's not just that meaning attaches itself to minimalism in the late 60s, but also that the simple certainties of abstraction that are proposed in the early 60s become almost instantly, within years, charged with complex ambiguities. And the bad news in that is clearly that despite utopian ambitions and despite programs, abstraction can't stay pure, and it can't stay empty, and it can't stay out of categories. But the good news is that it can incredibly revitalize our ability to embody new ideas in the most complex fashion, new ideas of ourselves, of our personalities, of our time. And I want to conclude with one other artist, Eva Hesse, to stress the liberating or empowering nature 
of what to many artists appear draconingly constraining, that is the minimalist box, the minimalist order. Here I show a Hesse painting construction called An Ear in a Pond of 1965, and only a year or two later, this untitled circles drawing in ink with small strings coming out of the circle. Hesse is a clear example of what minimalism can do for an artist positively. Hesse was involved in the mid-60s in a flailing around trying to find a body of imagery, trying to be able to invent something that was quirky enough and peculiar enough to contain her odd feelings about humor, funkiness, sexuality, uh, her position, etc. And what she produced was almost consistently klutzy, uh, usually unoriginal, etc., etc. It was only when she accepted to give this up and accept the rigidity of the simple program of doing things like painting circles. When she extracted, for example, that odd head out of the middle of that painting and said, that's not a head, that's just a circle. That's just a circle with a string coming out of it. When she said, I'm just going to make things. I'm just going to discipline, in fact, make the same thing again and again, then blooming comes the very personality, the very intense intimacy and complexity that she had sought for in her work, released by being pushed through the filter of minimalist work. Now, you can see her obvious dedication to minimalism and her critique in works like Addendum of 1967 on the right, or a session two on the, pardon me, Addendum on the left, or a session two on the right. A session two belongs with One Ton Prop, and the Burnt Cube by Jackie Windsor in terms of a critique of the idea of the geometric enclosure of Judd, Smith, et cetera, but what a difference. Somewhere between the kind of industrial hardness of Sarah and the organicism of Windsor, now you have this odd piece in which thousands of holes have been threaded with long rubber tubes and the tubes then cut off on the inside so that you get on the inside of this cube, not neutrality, not mystery, but something where the outside and the inside are related, the outside seeing uniform and nubbly, and then the inside evoking what? Fur, cilia, but something that generally has to do with a soft rub in which the repetition of the simple act of putting so many things in produces something that is more than the sum of its parts. So that one could find, if one was a feminist critic, for example, or even not, one could find that there was perhaps a vaginal reference, the idea of the interiority of this thing being soft and friction-free as opposed to the outside severity of it. But there's something about the residual minimalism which is not just the cube, but has to do with the industrial materials which saves this piece from being merely indulgently referential or evocative, but has a kind of hard sterility which works against its sensuality and makes it live in both worlds at once. Ditto the wall piece on the left, um, which certainly relates to Robert Morris and something like the rope piece of 1965 and also to Morris's felt pieces and Oldenburg's soft sculpture, but would by virtue of its static repetition, a la a Judd wall piece, has a whole different kind of connotation of hair, of accumulation, of things which the tectonic Morris seems to stay away from. Similarly, repetition in the form of the round knobs on the piece on the left, in its realization in an Andre-like, if you want, piece on the right, called Sequel of 1967, presses the metaphor of these simple things cast off of tennis balls in latex as being on the one hand breasts, for example, on the left, and on the right, uh, let's say it frankly, turds. Now there's something fecal uh, about the things on the right. The, the idea of gravity and their surface speaks to a different set of metaphors. It's specifically humbled industrial material, not chest thumping industrial material. It's certainly not rustic and organic like logs and twine. It's about latex and her discovery of latex as something which in the casting process is usually just instrumental, a way to get from point A to point B, but which for Hesse becomes extracted from the instrumental process to become expressive, to become her equivalent for Jasper Johns's encaustic. That is a fleshiness that it imparts to things, but now in terms of Hesse with a specifically kind of creepy sense of nubbly skin,
She likes the idea of covering and layering, as Windsor does, covering over by painting latex. And the long-range implications in the work come out being fecal, epidermal, uh, bodily. Um, this permeates a lot of Hesse's work, uh, like the untitled, or 1966, uh, on the left, um, which, uh, depending on how one wants to read it, is either a Diana of Ephesus or involved with a collection of scrota. Uh, it's certainly about bodily gravity in a very different way from the hearty, pot-bellied sag of Oldenburg's sculpture. It involves an uncertain reference to things that are not merely flaccid, but repellent, um, falling down to gravity in an unpleasant way. Few artists of this period need the vocabulary that Hesse's work needs. Sag, distend, pucker, crease, flap. But it is precisely, I think, by the minimalist inflection, by the repetition, by the industrial materials of Hesse's work, that this bodily reference, this organicism, is saved from being a merely corny, merely sloppy expressionism. What's really intriguing about Hesse is that the ultimate macho lineage from Pollock flinging paint through minimalism's interpretations of that should yield and give Hesse exactly what she needed to produce a vocabulary that has empowered countless feminist artists since and, and yield at the same time from all this a sharply personal achievement. Look finally at the last two pieces that Hesse did before she died right after of 1970 on the left and an untitled and probably unfinished rope piece of 1970 on the right. Because these pieces bring us exactly back to where we started, and that is with Pollock's drip paintings. And she's revisiting Pollock's challenge through the minimalist interpretation of the wholeness and simplicity of Pollock's work, of its non-relational order, of its emphasis on materials and process. And yet, she has come back closer to things in Pollock's work that the minimalists could not touch. The one thing having to do with the lyricism of aeration, the way that Pollock took gravity by painting on the floor and then turned it vertical so that one had associations of clouds as well as the fall of things. She has restored this kind of lyricism to the literalism of gravity. In a piece like this, a kind of elegance and delicacy a kind of grace of hanging goes with a real humility and funkiness that these things covered in latex, and here is a detail of the rope piece, for example, are strangled, clumsy, knotted, choked, that on the one hand you have this sense of the catenary perfection of the simple pull of gravity, and on the other hand the strangling together of tying things not with any given order, not with any repetition in an unexpected way. All that is complex and interesting about Hesse's work, a kind of comic or antic relationship, a bodily relationship, a kind of relationship between minimalist thinking and viscera and sinew and the interior of the body, go into this piece through its relationship to the minimalist reinterpretation of Pollock extrapolated as something deeply personal. So the piece has a kind of double pathos to go with its antic or comic nature. Not only the pathos that we know that Hesse died before she could complete this piece, but also that for all the permissions and possibilities that the tradition of abstraction has given her, its powerful model lives with her, that she exists within the framework of an emulation of something so strong. The combined constraint and power of Pollock's gift of minimalism's interpretation of it is realized in this work. Thank you.